happy little games. Robophobia is defined as having a fear of robots, drones, robot-like mechanics, artificial intelligence, viewing a robot, being near a robot, and especially watching a robot go to the bathroom. It's a very real thing that was initiated by the various creepy robots throughout our entertainment history, going back all the way to the 1919 series of silent films starring Harry Houdini entitled The Mysterious Master. There have been other evil robots that have wrecked terror upon the silver screen such as Maria, Ed 209, HAL 9000, Vera from Superman 3, and of course, Skynet. Today, the game we are checking out is nothing but robots. If you suffered from robophobia, this game would give you the cold sweats and heart palpitations similar to the first time you played Sticky Fingers with Mary Jane Rottencrotch. The game in question that we are talking about is Robotron 2084 and it was released by Williams in 1982. What arcade game was a major influence on this game? What was the original title for this game? What famous Marvel comic book character was an inspiration for one of the villains in this game? So grab your joysticks and get ready to destroy some robots because this is the history of Robotron 2084. The year is 1981 and video game designer, resident genius and pleasure dome scammer Eugene Jarvis just had inspiration strike for his next mega arcade classic. Now when I say video game designer and genius in the same sentence, you better believe I mean it. Mr. Jarvis cut his teeth early in his career working for HP for just a few days and then over to Atari programming some of the first pinball machines with microprocessors including Superman. Atari's pinball branch failed a few years later so he moved to Chicago programming pinball machines for Williams. His first major success was Defender, which was an absolute classic and one of the top 10 best games of all times, in my opinion. Mr. Jarvis was a fan of not only classic video games that he drew inspiration from, such as Space Invaders and Asteroids, but at the time he was heavily into the game Berserk. While he loved the confined single screen action, what he didn't like was that you had to fire in the direction you were facing. He realized that he could fire in any direction as long as he held the fire button in, but to do that you had to remain stationary. This is when a light bulb went off in his head and the dual joystick option was first thought of. This allowed greater freedom of movement with the character and also introduced a fantastic gaming mechanic. The dual control scheme was worked into another game Mr. Jarvis was in the middle of developing entitled Robot War, which was similar to Robotron 2084, but there was no shooting involved. You were surrounded by robots, but rather than shoot them, you had to get them to collide into the barricades or themselves. He quickly mounted a couple of Atari 2600 joysticks to a board as a prototype, and almost immediately knew he was absolutely on the right track. Eugene Jarvis had teamed up with Larry DeMar to design what would become Robotron 2084. The duo had teamed up previously on Defender and his follow-up Stargate. Since robots were still very popular and Mr. Jarvis was a huge fan of the George Orwell novel 1984, he decided to incorporate this theme into the game. Since the year of 1984 was rapidly approaching, they decided to add 100 years and make it set in 2084. 2084 was also the original title for this game. Early into the design of this game, Mr. Jarvis had wanted to implement a story which helps trigger human emotions because you had to rescue a human family which in turn gives you more points and motivates you to keep playing. Similar to the old saying, Big money! Big prizes! I love it! 
There are 255 levels, or waves as they are referred to as, in the game. The enemy design was truly groundbreaking at the time. Each enemy displayed unique traits which included random elements programmed into each one. Thanks to some clever algorithms, the levels are generated on the fly which means every game you play is going to be different. The graphics were designed in just two weeks, while the entire game itself took six months. Mr. Jarvis has said four of the six months were spent playtesting and fine-tuning it just to get it absolutely perfect. After an early play session, Mr. Jarvis had decided to up the number of robots to 128 on screen at once, and within moments, he was a sweating, gasping mass of smoking neurons. The game will surely induce panic and possibly the onset of robophobia due to the sheer amount of machines attempting to wipe you from existence. You have to have nerves of steel and excellent twin joystick handling, the likes of which I haven't seen since Easy Evelyn back in high school. Mr. Jarvis had noticed that cigarette burns on the control panel for the game would appear not only on the right side, but the left side as well. He said it was about a 50-50 mix of rights and left-handed players. He said this was very unusual since left-handers make up only 15% of the population. Lefties are seen as more ambidextrous and according to Mr. Jarvis, this makes them better Robotron players. Robotron 2084 was released by Williams in 1982. As the story goes, in the year 2084, man finally perfects the Robotrons. These are a series of robots so advanced that after seeing how low down and scummy human beings are, they conclude that the human race is inefficient and must be destroyed. You take on the role of an unnamed protagonist with either giant bug eyes or some rather large goggles who is the last hope of mankind. Due to an engineering error, you now possess superhuman powers. Your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to stop the Robotrons and save the last human family on Earth, including Mommy, Daddy, and Little Mikey. This twin-stick shooter featured a number of enemies to deal with, including Ground Roving Units Network Terminators, or Grunts for short, the Indestructible Hulk, who, surprise, surprise, is based on The Incredible Hulk, which was a popular live-action TV show at the time. Another reason he was indestructible was Mr. Jarvis loved the menacing aspect of Evil Otto from Berserk and wanted something similar here. Spheroids and Quarks, which manufacture enforcers and tanks. And finally the giant brains that have the power to reprogram and lure humans over to the dark side. As if that wasn't enough, electrodes are in your path which have to be avoided, otherwise you will die. And you will die plenty. The action starts off hot and heavy with you being given a two second window to get a look at the enemy location then it's off to the races. You are placed in the middle of the screen with enemies surrounding you and advancing at a rapid rate. It's either fight or flight and it's a matter of shooting all the robots while rescuing as many humans as you can. The human family also introduces progressive scoring. It motivates you to get as many humans as possible since 25,000 will give you an extra life. Thankfully, your projectiles will not harm the humans. The grunts will go towards you at an accelerated pace, but to make it a bit more fair, they are never faster than you. It doesn't matter though, because they will continually descend upon you until you are finished. The enemies are pretty smart, as certain baddies, such as the enforcers, use something called projective algorithms. If your character is in motion, rather than shoot directly at the player, the enforcers will shoot within 10 pixels of your location and it still might hit you. The further you are from an enemy, the faster the shots get and as crazy as it seems, it's actually safer to be closer to the enemy. Thankfully, 
You can shoot enemy projectiles, but you need to be quick draw McGraw in order to do this with everything flying around the screen. The game gets really hard really quick as the first wave sees a small amount of grunts on the screen with only a couple of humans to rescue. The second screen introduces the indestructible hulks which can't be killed but you can slow them down by shooting them. As I mentioned, there are 255 waves to complete with each gaming experience being unique. The multicolor graphics and separating scanned line effects are a sight to behold and the sound effects are pure early 1980s arcade goodness. The black background really makes everything stand out, especially the enemies since this game is all about the enemies. The twin sticks provide a level of control that just couldn't be done with a single fire button so kudos to Mr. Jarvis for thinking of this. The twin stick style of shooting would be resurrected with Williams' later arcade game Smash TV. Robotron was a massive success selling close to 20,000 units. Although the game was play tested rigorously for at least a few months, a couple of bugs still managed to worm its way into the game. If Mikey is captured by the player early, the brains will start seeking out the other family members closest to them. You can save the other family members while the brains are seeking Mikey. The Mikey bug only happens when no humans were left abandoned on the previous wave. Taking advantage of this will allow you to rack up as many points and extra lives as possible. Also, if a tank fires 20 shots and doesn't hit anything, they will stop shooting. Williams did release an official sequel to Robotron by the name of Blaster in 1983. This is a first-person rail shooter that was again developed by Eugene Jarvis and Larry DeMar. The game is more similar to Defender in a 3D environment. The graphics were pretty good at the time, giving you a slight sense of immersion if you can get past the large blocky sprites. I only played this a few times back in the day and thought it was okay, which was apparently the general public's reaction as well because it didn't last very long in my arcade. The hero character from Robotron appeared as a non-playable character in LEGO Dimensions. There have been other shooters that have taken inspiration from this game such as Geometry Wars and the Fuzzy Wuzzy Llamatron that was released by the Fuzzy Wuzzy himself, Jeff Minter. This was a fantastic game that revolved around Mr. Minter's favorite animal llamas instead of robots. Pixel Perfect versions were also released for MS-DOS, Windows, PlayStation, and Dreamcast. A stripped-down black-and-white version was also released for the extremely poorly received Game.com. It was also released on Xbox Live. In 1996, the company released a full-on follow-up to the game entitled Robotron X for the PlayStation. This is an updated 3D version of the original game but thankfully uses the original controls with the face buttons being used to replicate the second joystick. The screen now scrolls a bit so you don't really get that sense of confinement and danger that you did with the first game. This does include some extras such as bosses and bonus rounds and you still need to rescue as many humans as possible. There are 100 levels of playthrough. It's a pretty good update, but to me, nothing will top the original. In 1998, Robotron 64 was released for the 
surprise, surprise, Nintendo 64, which was a port of this game. I know I don't usually talk about unlicensed conversions, but Atari 2600 developer of the century Champ Games did a fantastic version entitled Robot War 2684. Which, let's be honest, they had to use some special kind of voodoo that they do do to accomplish this on the wooden 2600. This features three different difficulty levels twin stick support for that true arcade feel, and graphics and sounds that nobody thought was possible on the system. Everything from the arcade game is here including all 255 waves. We even get the high score screen. It's a fantastic conversion and one worth picking up if you are a fan of Robotron. Try as I might, I could not properly record video footage for this game. Robotron is right up there with Pac-Man and Donkey Kong in terms of the number of official conversions that were released back in the day. Atari Soft were in charge of most of these and it was released for a wide variety of video game systems and home computers. As to be expected, these conversions were designed with only one joystick and one fire button in mind, so sacrifices had to be made. The first one we are looking at is the Chunky Like a Monkey VIC-20 version. If you thought the game was high pressured and hectic before, just wait until you try the cramped VIC version. Since everything is so large, the feeling of confinement is even worse. Not to mention, the general size of each of the sprites makes everything rather ugly. The colors are not good with sickly yellows and blues. The indestructible green hulk is now a bland blue. The speed is also a bit on the slow side, but at least for a single joystick and one fire button, it doesn't control too bad. Moving right along is the Apple II version. This is surprisingly well done. We get the arcade attract mode telling the story and how to play the game. When it starts up, you are surrounded by grunts and hulks right off the bat. Everything looks similar to the arcade game except the humans look like tiny little ants that just learned to walk on two legs. The bullets and the humans are roughly the same size and color so the humans can get lost in the shuffle. The sound effects are pretty good, especially on this primitive machine. Overall, it's not too bad of a conversion. The BBC Micro doesn't get a whole lot of attention on this channel, but this version is a step up from the VIC-20. It does look very similar, but it is slightly faster and the graphics are smaller and more detailed. The sound effects are decent and get the job done. A homebrew version was done a number of years later that is much better, so Google it if you are curious. Let's switch over to the console version and take a look at the Atari 5200. This is a pretty good conversion, although once again the colors are washed out, but at least the sprites are detailed and the gameplay is similar to the arcade game. The sound effects do a good job at replicating the ones found in the arcade game, but the problem lies with the controls. 
Those pesky 5200 controllers just don't work that great when it comes to this game. Apparently you can use two joysticks on this version, but I couldn't get it to work for some reason. Otherwise, it is a good conversion. The game was also released for the Atari 8-bit line of computers and they are pretty much identical from what I can see. The Texas Instruments 99 version is merely okay. The sprites are all single color and there is a bit of flickering going on when things get hot and heavy. The gameplay though was fairly smooth and the speed is similar to the arcade original. The sound effects do a pretty good job as well. For only using one fire button it does a pretty good job at replicating the arcade's controls. <laughs> If you want some truly ugly colors, be sure and check out the MS-DOS version. This is straight up 4 color CGA graphics but with one difference from the Apple versions which is smaller sprites that are more detailed. The gameplay is fairly smooth especially for an ancient MS-DOS game and it does feel like the arcade game. The sound effects though are another story with pure PC speaker blasting that pure queefy goodness right in your face. If you don't mind a little stank in your sound, this isn't a bad conversion. The good old Commodore 64 version is up next and it's a rather average conversion. While the graphics are nowhere as large and chunky as the VIC-20 version, the colors are still extremely washed out. It's orange and yellow palooza with a dash of blue mixed in here and there. The speed of the game is not good but it gets particularly worse when you attempt to run diagonally. It's astonishing that the Acorn Electron version runs so much better. At least in this version you can use two joysticks which does help out the overall package. The Spectrum port is here and surprisingly it is really well done. It does use single color sprites obviously but color clash has been kept to a minimum and the characters are easily recognizable. The gameplay is fast, almost a bit too fast when compared to the arcade game. The sound is your typical bloops and bleeps but thankfully it's been kept to a minimum. There is an option to use two joysticks with this version as well. Overall, it's a darn fine conversion. Another computer that doesn't get a whole lot of love on this channel is the Acorn Electron. This version though is nicely well done. Although the graphics are a bit on the wide side, everything moves along at a brisk pace. The sound effects are adequate, leaning not to the good side and not to the queefy side but somewhere right in the middle. It plays pretty well for a 1983 home conversion.
Switching back to the consoles, we have the Atari 7800 version. For starters, you have dual stick support provided you have some way to secure each joystick. The graphics are fairly detailed, but again, we are missing the color green from the indestructible hulks. The gameplay is fast and fairly smooth, although it does tend to slow down when a lot is happening on the screen. In dual stick mode, the gameplay feels pretty good. The Atari ST version was released in 1987 and it looks very close to the arcade original. It's not exact by any means, but at the time, this was as close as you were going to get to the arcade game at home. The sound effects are also good along with the playability. Apparently, you can use two joysticks, but I could not figure out how to get this done. Even with one fire button though, it plays great. The oh so tiny but ever so powerful Atari Lynx also received a conversion. Released in 1991, this was one of the best arcade conversions on the Atari Lynx right up there with Stun Runner. The sprites are definitely larger and there is not as many on screen at once but they are detailed. The sound effects have been sampled straight from the arcade game and they sound great. Everything from the arcade game has been included, such as the attract screens, but what didn't make the cut were the controls. With only two fire buttons on the links, shortcuts obviously had to be taken. It doesn't matter though, because it still controls really good, and if you had an itch to play Robotron on the road back in the day, this was the best version to get. <laughs> The game was released along with three other titles in the Midway's greatest arcade hits for the Game Boy Advance. Despite the small screen size, the characters are nicely detailed and the gameplay speed is close to the arcade game. There is very little slowdown even when things get hot and heavy. The sound effects have also been sampled from the arcade game and most of them have been included. Once again, the controls rear their ugly head but it could have been avoided. It would have been nice to be able to use the shoulder buttons in addition to the face buttons to shoot in four separate directions, but we just weren't given that option. Even still, the one fire button works pretty good. was also released as part of the compilation Williams Arcade's Greatest Hits for the Super Nintendo. This is a fantastic conversion that looks very close to the arcade game. The sound effects are spot on and thanks to the multi-button Super Nintendo controller it plays fantastic. The Sega Genesis version looks very close to the Super Nintendo version, but the sound has taken a bit of a hit in terms of quality. The standard three button controller works okay, but it does have support for the six button Genesis pad, which makes things feel a whole lot better. Robotron 2084 has definitely stood the test of time in terms of not only its unique controls, but also thanks to its fantastic game design. 
As Mr. Jarvis said, it's either fight or flight, and this game separates the little boys going wee-wee from the grown men going in the woods. It is definitely a hard game to play, but the controls are fantastic, and it's one of those games where you want to keep trying just one more time. If you have any sort of blood pressure or heart issues, make sure you take your medicine before playing this game. Your family members will be glad you did. If you like this video and enjoy my content, be sure to like, comment, share, and subscribe. Also, if you would like to support me on Patreon or make a one-time donation, please see the link below. Thanks everybody for watching.